lot to do to make all my luck or late dreams come true. Hello everybody, Bob Luss, coming at you live from the world headquarters of Pond Boss Magazine in the balmy hills of North Texas outside of Gordonville. Of course, Jason Nepstad, your first one up, you usually are. And by the way, I got your questions, I just hadn't had a chance to sit down and answer those yet. So welcome, glad you could join me today. Kind of been away from this for a couple of weeks and I missed it. So I'm looking forward to having a pretty good time with you guys tonight. I do want to entertain your questions, so when you get a chance to do that, we'll pitch a few at me. Tonight's topic is going to be about the tools that we use in pond management. Now, this is going to apply to you as well because there's some of these things you can do. Gene Jensen's checking in. Hello, Gene. Hadn't talked to you in a long time. Good to see you, man. He's got his own YouTube. He's kind of got this thing going on. Gene does. Frank James, Shannon Kane. Looks like we've got a pretty good crew of folks checking in. So what I'm going to do is, like I always do, I'm going to uh, refresh my computer so I can see your questions and your thoughts. Kind of hard to see them on the phone when you're broadcasting. As we're doing that, the January-February issue of Pond Boss is in the mail screen. People are getting it. It's going on. So uh, if you haven't gotten one, let us know. We'll send you one so you can check it out. There's some great articles in this issue. Matter of fact, since we're talking about that, I'll let you know some of the things we got going on in here. Let's see. We've got, uh, oh, there's a great story in here about all-female bass. That's a good story to kind of give you a, a primer on, you know, maybe should you use female largemouth bass? Maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. Uh, there's some, a story about some key management tools that we use, like I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, do largemouth bass move in flooding events? Dave Beasley covered that. I wrote one in uh, on Northern Pond, but what's going on under the ice biologically? I know we got a lot of ice fishermen out here, and you guys know what you got to do to catch them. You know, but how'd they get there? And what are they doing under the ice? How are they acting? Where does pond water come from? That's a pretty interesting deal. Then we've got another time, Otto's got a story in here. Anyway, there's a bunch of them. Otto's story is about inspecting ponds and lakes. You know, because now is the time of year that you need to be taking a look at your dam, make sure it's safe, make sure things are rocking like they should be. You know, that there's no trees growing on the dam, that there's, uh, that everything's going like you want it to, you know, so... Inspecting Dam, there's a real good story about that. Let me see what we got. Clint Loveday, Mike Cottrell, Frank James, Billy Burks, three other people. Fred Bingaman's on here, it looks like. John Funk, no ice to fish. Man, that's kind of weird. You know, I think I'm going to write a story about that, John. Now, I know there's no ice to fish in right now. That's kind of crazy because where you are, I know you had some, but now you don't. Uh, you guys that have been on here quite a bit, Mike Cottrell, I hope you got your hat and mug. If you didn't, let me know. Speaking of which... Pond Boss hat, Pond Boss mug. If you will, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comment section. Click like and share this on your timeline now. Then that makes you eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a mug. We've been doing quite a few of those here lately. Billy Birch, what's up, brother? Well, I'll tell you what's up. The temperature's up. Rain falls up. Temperature's about to go down. I see Bruce Condello checking in with us. Hi, Bruce. Good to see you, my dear friend. Let's see here, um, Chris Rigoni. I saw something about you, Chris. I don't remember what it was, probably on Facebook. Let me, uh, let me get into the topic tonight. I want to talk about tools of the trade. You know, as I, as I get to talking to folks, now be sure, and sh I see my wife, Debbie, checking in. First thing she'll do is she will share this video on her timeline, and I promise you, just within a couple of minutes, some of her friends will be watching it. And that's what we want you to do. If you'll share this to your timeline, let some of your friends see it, they'll start watching it, and then we can build an audience and help spread the wealth of knowledge that, that we have to share with you guys and uh, you know, spread the good news upon management. Tom Davis checking in from Ohio. So what I want to talk about, tools of the trade, and I'm going to give you a real-world example. Part of what gave me the idea for this topic, I had Leanne post it up today, was I got a call over the weekend from a guy uh, a man in Dallas just bought 120 acres along the Red River east of me. And he's on that 120 acres, he's got a small pond and he thinks he's got a site to build a pond. So what he wanted to do, he's, he's so excited, he wants to uh, turn that property into a recreational property. It butts up to a big ranch. It's a cattle ranch. And he sees deer coming across his land all the time. So he wants to manage for deer. But he also has got a couple of young children, six and eight, and he wants them to have a place to go fishing and then maybe a place 
where he thinks is some some eroded areas of uh, of where the it falls where maybe he could build maybe he could build upon there. So he wants to explore that. So what I thought I'd do today is give you guys some ideas on some of the tools at your disposal and tools at my disposal. You know, fisheries pond management guys like me that can uh, uh, assist you when you're evaluating, monitoring, and managing ponds and lakes, especially. Daniel Hed Hendrick, have a, I have, don't remember your name. Good to see you from Tyler. Jacob West joining in. Good, Jacob. Hey, if it quits raining, let's go take a look at your place. I know you hadn't been able to move any dirt over there. Good gosh, it's going to rain again Friday here. Um, I'll never complain about rain, trust me. The, uh, here's the, here's the, I want to kind of go through this thought process in an orderly fashion. So here's what I told this guy, because we talked about 45 minutes as I was driving over the weekend. And he said, what do I do? He says, I found this land. I've been looking for about a year and a half. And now I got it. I, I don't know if I've got a tiger by the tail or a, you know, or a, or a, a, a pet dog on a leash. So what do I do? And I said, well, here's the first thing you need to do is write down your goals. Don't just think about it. Write them down. And Daniel McWhorter, Danny Mack, good evening. Happy New Year to you, buddy. Bill Russell, thanks. Thanks for welcoming me back. I'm glad to be back to do this. I'm finally in a position because I've been, with the holidays, I've been rolling and rolling and going, man. It's been fun. I got to see all the kids, most of the grandkids, good stuff. So here's what I told the guy. I said, write down your goals. And I'm going to tell you all the same thing. If you don't know your goals or you haven't given it any thought, you're not going to reach those goals. <laughs> So take some time and write down your goals. I mean, right now is a great time to do that. We're thinking about the new year as it is. If, if you know your goals, it's almost like a target. And you got a much, much better chance at hitting that target. Hi, Steve Lewis. Good to see you, buddy. So, uh, oh, good, Bruce. Thanks for sharing it to, to Big Bluegill community. That's great, man. If people can get on and watch it, that's huge. Betty Patterson in Dallas. Now, see, that's one of Debbie's friends. Debbie shared the video Betty saw it on Debbie's timeline. Now Betty's checked in. Pat Williamson, good to see you. So that's what I want you guys to do is to share the video on your timeline. And that way your friends, if they've got a pond or a lake or some land in the country, they can listen in and see what we're doing. So the first thing I told him to do was write down your goals. And we went over that probably for five minutes of that 45 minute conversation he said, you know, really, I want, I want a really pretty pond because we're going to, as time allows and money allows, we're going to build a cabin where we can see the pond. The pond's at the bottom of a hill, kind of down in a swale, and we want to build a little cabin up there that we can use on weekends for the kids. He's got a boy six and a girl eight, and we want to be able to go out and enjoy the heck out of that pond and see it. First of all, so it needs to be pretty. I said, is it pretty now? He says, yeah, it's really pretty now. He said, that's part of the reason that we bought it. Kirk Kruger, checking in. And so he said, the second thing is I want the kids to learn how to fish. He said, we live in Dallas. You know, we live in a neighborhood. There's a pond at the park, but there's no fish in it. They don't manage that pond. Once a year, they put a few catfish in it, and they don't do anything. There's Lydia North checking in. Happy birthday this week, girl. I saw that. Looked like you had a big time on your birthday. Welcome. And so uh, and there's Tim Jackson. Hey, how about them Clemson Tigers, brother? You're pretty happy about that. Nicole Graney's checking in. Christine Fowler, goal number one, a cruise to Belize, Cosmel Harn Dush next month. Goal number two, fish more in 2019 with at least one special trip with my cousin. That's good. Good for you. Well, you already got the cruise figured out. Now you got to figure out how to catch more fish at your pond. Louis Henry checking in. The uh, uh, So as we talked about it, he really wants to have a fun fishing pond. And then he, he thinks he's got a spot where he could build a five or six acre lake that he, for himself, he'd like to have a bass fishing lake. So that's kind of what he's thinking about. Jacob West, happy one year anniversary of this Facebook thing. Yeah, it is. It has been a, it has been a year, hasn't it? That's pretty cool. So he said, so goal number one for you, Bob, is to help me with this existing pond. So I got on Google Earth and I found it. And that pond is just under an acre, shaped kind of like a teardrop, like a lot of ponds are, you know, that are in a watershed. So I, uh, I measured it just under a, an acre, and then I went backwards on, on Google Earth, because you can go back in time. And that pond was only like 10 years old, which is pretty good. 
So the landowner before him actually built it for water for livestock. So there's no structure, no cover. So I started talking to him about the different kind of uh, tools at his disposal. Said, so first, do you have any fish? He says, well, you know, I've only had it for a couple of weeks, but during our due diligence and when it was under contract, I went down and, and looked and I could I think I could see some fish. So I said, well, the first thing we need to do, and I'm going to tell you this, if you have an existing pond, the first thing you need to do is evaluate. So what that means to me when I tell you to evaluate is you want to go look at the dam. So you want it to be structurally sound. So the first thing to do is go look at the dam. Make sure there's not a bunch of big trees growing on it. Make sure there's no holes in it, that there's been no burrows by muskrats, mink, uh, uh, nutria, uh, beavers, whatever. And check out the dam and make sure the dam's in good shape. That's job one. Then job number two is to, let's do some water chemistry. Cost 25 bucks to go get baseline water chemistry. Now, 99 times out of 100, heck, 99 and a half times out of 100, the water chemistry is just fine to have a healthy pond. You know, and so, let's get there. Joy Searle, Mark Cornelius, Christine's fishing with crickets and cane poles. That's how I like to do it, too. Ashi Saluki. Hello, everybody. Good to see you, Ashi. <laughs> and so, uh, the first thing to do is, is get your water chemistry checked. And it's not necessarily because there's anything wrong with your water chemistry, but we do want a, uh, we do want a, uh, a baseline water chemistry so we can understand the health of your water. Because if something does go wrong at some point, like it does too many times with people, the first thing we want to do is eliminate water quality or water chemistry is the problem. So evaluate water chemistry. I, I use Texas A&M Soil Sciences Lab. You can send in, just get a bottle of water like this. Take a bottle like that, fill it up with water out of your pond. They got shipping instructions, 25 bucks, and they'll email you the results. And heck, have them copy me, BobLusk at Outlook.com, and I'll help you interpret what that water chemistry means. So, uh, um, and Billy Cox checking in. Good to see you, Billy. So let's get to water chemistry. We want to know what kind of shape your water chemistry is in just as a reference point. The next thing is to figure out, do you have any fish? Well, there's several ways to do that. For guys that aren't in a hurry, you go fishing. You know, but don't just fish with one type of bait, one type of lure. Go out and try to figure out the different species of fish because here's what we want to know. We want to know the species of fish. We want to know how many different sizes there are, size classes. Bam, 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 bam. We want to know the size classes of each species, and we want to know what kind of shape are those fish in. Are they healthy? Are they happy? <clears throat> Do they have uh, lengths and weights that are appropriate for that species of fish? Now, you can do that with a seine. You can go buy a, a 40 foot seine, a 20 foot seine at Walmart. You can order some online. You can do that. I wouldn't do it today because it's too cold. But if you're going to go fishing and you don't, and you really don't know the species of fish, and I'm going to tell you, most new landowners think they know the species of fish, but they really don't. So if you're not sure, take pictures of the fish and put them on the Palm Boss forum or send them to me, text them to me, call me, whatever. I'll help you figure out what you got. Now, if you, if, now you're going to have to go through some data to make good decisions on what you need to do about that fishery. So now here's how a pro would do it. Even on a small one acre, one acre pond, we'd probably bring our electric fishing boat over. Now we want the water to warm up a little bit so the fish are moving shallow. You can only electric fish down six or eight feet. And in most ponds, you can't see any deeper than that anyway. You know, so even if you shocked a few fish down at eight or nine feet, you couldn't see them and the odds of them floating up are pretty slow, pretty slim. So what we want to do is, is with our electrofishing boat, if you hire a, a pond management company like mine or Greg Grimes or Solitude or somebody like that, they'd bring an electrofishing boat and get in there, American sport fish, folks like that, when go in and take some random samples, collect some fish, identify them, weigh and measure the bass, look at the ratios, judge the body condition, and from that, then you can make wise decisions. It's very common that I get calls from somebody who says, I'd like to buy a bunch of bluegills and some minnows, and I want to put some bass in my pond. But the problem is, is they don't really know what's in there. And if you don't know what's in there, then you really don't know what you should stock. 
Brad Rom, hello, Brad. Frank James, we have a large wooden porch and stairs that are being replaced. I'd love to use them as extra habitat in the lake, but I'm a little scared of any chemicals they may contain, like pesticides or water sealant. Any suggestions on whether and how to use the scrap? Well, first of all, make sure it's not treated lumber, because if it is treated lumber, don't use it in the pond. Uh, if it if it if it's still good lumber, which I don't know if it is or not, uh, you could sure make a pretty cool observation deck, you know, above your pond right there. Because, Frank, I know where your place is over in East Texas. There's Trana Madonna. Hey, Trana. Mike Bucket checking in. Mike, good to see you, man. Everything over there on the, in the southeast. Man, Mike makes some really great swim baits. You need to look him up. Click on his Facebook. Look, after we're off, come back and find him and click on his Facebook page. That dude does some big, big time stuff with fish baits. So, uh, as you evaluate your fishery, now, as we get ready to evaluate a fishery, we're getting ready to go do one here in about six weeks when the water starts to warm up. And this one's going to be a pretty big lake that we've had under contract for about four years now. And not only will we use, Jason Nepstead, why shouldn't you use treated lumber? Because most of the time, treated lumber has arsenic in it, or it's got, um, I can't remember what they treat it with, but I don't like the chemical that they treat treated lumber with. It's there. They put in, they, they soak the lumber in it so it doesn't deteriorate in the weather. And honestly, I don't remember what the chemical is, but it's not good for water. So I wouldn't, now if you want to use it on a dock platform, that's fine because it won't be in the water. You know, so you can do that. The, uh, now, uh, let's see where, oh yeah, we're going to evaluate this lake. So what we're going to do there is the tools we have, we've got electrofishing equipment, We've got a Smith Root research boat, weighs about 3,500 pounds, carries eight people in there comfortably. We use that boat to go collect fish in shallow water around the littoral zone, shallow, around the perimeter of the lake. <clears throat> so we'll be shocking in aquatic plant beds, you know, in shallow water when the fish are shallow. And what we'll do is collect them, put them in a big live well where we're pumping fresh water from the lake, continuing circulating fresh water. And then we'll stop periodically, and then we'll stop and weigh and measure those fish and just take an inventory and then put them back in the lake where they go. And if we catch very many, a lot of times we'll stop just within 100 yards of where we collect them so we can release them and then go back to where they were. The uh, Hi, Daryl. Good to see you, man. And so uh, uh, other tools we will use on that lake, we have fight nets, which are hoop nets with, with some wings that come out. So we'll put those parallel to the shore where fish that have to be fish that are swimming along the shore have to run down the funnel and then run into the net and the net a big hoop it's bigger than this as they come in in the back of the hoop it's a cone so they swim through that cone then there's another section then another section and in the back end the nets tied together so the fish will swim through several cones and then collect in the in the net and then we will uh, leave it out overnight. Then the next morning, go run it and pull the fish out. And that way we can catch fish that are coming up out of the deep over you know, a 10 or 12 hour period as they migrate. So then uh, there's Morgan Tyler checking in. Hey, Morgan, good to see you, man. Uh, thank you for Purina. He works for Purina Mills. And thank them for their sponsorship. They're one of our sponsors for this show, as is Texas Hunter Feeders. And we got a new sponsor, American Sport Fish Hatchery from Montgomery, Alabama is sponsoring us as well now for a little bit. Todd Austin, good to see you, buddy. So uh, uh, not only will we electrofish set fight nets, but we'll also set gill nets. Now the thing about these other sampling tools is they don't harm the fish. But when we set gill nets, we're gonna run them about every three hours all night long. Now the reason being is that the fish swim through the net, it gets caught in their gills and if you don't get them out fast, they're going to die. Now, gill nets are good to capture fish that are in deeper water. We use what's called experimental gill nets. And the way those work is they're 50 feet long in 10-foot sections. The first section is 3 inches. The next section is 2.5, um, then 2 inches, then 1.5, then 1, and then half inch. And we put the half inch side, per we're going to run the whole net perpendicular to the shore, suspended in the water column so there's floats that hold it up toward the surface then the net drops about 10 or 12 feet down and that way and we can adjust the depth that we allow it to be in and the big mesh goes out in deeper water 
Uh, a couple of our nets are 100 feet long. A couple of them are 50 feet long. So it graduates in half inch sizes of mesh. That way we can capture some big fish, some medium sized fish, and some small fish. Craig Guffin, Josh Counts, Chris Ketchum, good to see Chris checking in. So the gill nets, that's how we catch, in this particular lake we're gonna sample, that's how we capture crappie. And we stocked walleye in that lake as well. So that's how we capture some walleye. And if we're not running that net at least every three hours, if a walleye is in there for three hours, it's gonna die. So we run those nets at least, at least every three hours, oftentimes every two hours, <clears throat> all through the course of the night. We got a bunch of new people checking in, so I'll take another minute. Pond Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year. You know, Debbie and I went to lunch at, at uh, um, Olive Garden yesterday. I had a glass of wine at lunch, 1.30. <clears throat> and she had, and I had a salad. We still spent 38 bucks, you know, 35 bucks. That meal's already gone. This lasts a year. <clears throat> so, there are several sampling tools. Electrofishing, gill nets, trap nets, or fight nets, or hoop nets, which all do the same thing. The other sampling tool that you can use is the same. Now, when I'm talking about seining a pond, all you need is a 20-foot seine. And do this late in the spring, even into the summer. And if you just go pull the seine out, one guy at each end, you got it tied on the broomsticks or two-by-twos or something. You go out, swing down a, a swath of the shore. Be sure there's no vegetation because you get hung up. And then come around and pull the seine up and lift it up real quick. What that tells you is what your reproduction has been. So how well did the fish reproduce? So we're using these sampling tools to collect fish so we can analyze the fish. And then we're looking at the ratios. We're looking at, you know, how many, how many five pound and up bass do we have? What kind of shape are they in? What do their relative weights look like? We're look, comparing that to how many 10 to 12 inches, 12 to 14 inches, six to eight inches. How many adult bluegills? How many small bluegills? The whole bit. So we're looking at several things by using electrofishing, gill nets, trap nets, fight nets, hoop nets, seines. I don't know if I said gill nets. We're, we're collecting fish so that we can get a representative sample of that fishery, and then we can evaluate the fish to draw a conclusion about the status of the fishery. Now, Going back to our example of the guy, there's Clyde Douglas. Hey, Clyde, checking in from uh, North Cackalack. Good to see you from the Raleigh-Durham area. Good to see you, man. So, um, Craig Guffin. So, uh, uh, Craig Guffin's got it. Just hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like. And right now, if you don't mind, share the video to your timeline so we can build an audience. I've already seen three of Debbie's friends on here from where she shared it earlier. <clears throat> and so now, once we get these uh, samples of fish, now we can judge the fishery. And what, when we're judging the fishery, what are we looking at? We're really looking at the body condition and the ratios of the different species of fish tell us the status of the food chain, tells us if we need to harvest any game fish or not. It gives us some really sound data to see how things worked last year if we sampled it last year. We can compare last year to this year, and we can start to see what's really going on so we can make some smart management decisions. I can't tell you how many times somebody would call me and say, like this guy over the weekend, he said, hey, I think I want to buy some fish because I really want to get this thing going. Hey, Sean Banks, fisheries biologist checking in, Midwest Lake uh, Pond Management, builder of outstanding electric fishing boat. Tron and Madonna is starting a new pond in Burleson. Well, you need the pond boss. You and Randy, let me know. I come down through that way quite often. I'd love to come by and see what you're up to. There's Willie Howe checking in. Willie spawns full. It rained again and again and again. So uh, uh, when he said, I, I think I just want to buy some fish. I said, well, you can do that. Or we can come in since the pond's not really that old and you think you can see some fish. Either you evaluate and see if you've got any fish or let us come evaluate and see if you have any fish. So he had a legitimate question. He says, what do you charge to come evaluate electrofish and see what I've got? And I said, 1250 bucks. He said, well, can I buy a lot of fish for that? And I said, yeah, you can, and you're guessing. And now if you do it, 
we could talk about that. You need to buy some adult fish because you, if you have fish, you're going to have adult fish. So, you know, the, the, the upside of, of sampling a lake is you're going to know what you have. Now, if this was a lake that was 10 acres or 15 acres, I'd say, yeah, you need to, you need to pay the bill. You need to pay the man to come electrofish, do the sampling, because with a 10-acre lake, you could spend $10,000 on fish and mess it up. You know, so the bottom line is get a starting point. And once you have a starting point, then you can make wise decisions on whether you need to stock fish. I, I can't tell you how many times I've come across a lake where you didn't need to stock fish, you needed to harvest fish. So if you're stocking fish on top of fish that need to be harvested, that doesn't make any sense. So uh, it's a good idea to evaluate no matter what. Now, you're gonna evaluate the dam, you're gonna evaluate the water, uh, the tools you have for evaluating water is chemistry. Uh, the tools you have to manage water is aeration. Aeration takes the form of anything from bottom diffused aeration to um, it can be uh, like Bruce Candelo uses circulators. Bruce likes to make water turbulent uh, in a small area which sends ripples out over a big area. So rather than using a bottom diffused aeration system, Bruce chooses to use a a circulator, which makes the water move like a current, like a river would. And there's all kinds of circulators. There's vertical circulators. There's horizontal circulators. Horizontal circulators can be angled to where they're diagonal circulators, where you're picking water off the bottom and blowing it to the top, or you can take water on the bottom and angle it with a current down, down toward the bottom. So with your water, you have all kinds of tools. You also have other tools. If you've got an old pond that, where the water is uh, murky, yucky, green, where, you, where you've got harmful algae, uh, there's microbes that you can use to figure out or to help mitigate what's going on with old water that's nutrient laden. See, Frank James says, Electrosurvey really saved my bacon. I was able to take action in time to correct stunted bass situation. That's right. That's another reason to electrofish because if you do have a bass cradle, I got a message from a guy today that I'm going to call back tomorrow where he's worried that his bass are so overcrowded that now it's just disrupted the whole lake and he's got about a 50-acre lake. So odds are high that he's going to want us to come electrofish because if you got a 50-acre lake and you need to take 30 bass per acre, huh, do the math on that, 1,500 bass to correct a stunted bass lake? it would be worth his money to pay to have an electrofish just to harvest these overcrowded, underweight, largemouth bass. So in that case, that's a tool in fisheries management that would be smart to use and help him get his lake back on track. Uh, we've talked about some of the tools with, with the fish. What about vegetation? You know, at this time of year, I see Dusty Allen checking in. You know, this time of year, um, trying to figure out what's going on with aquatic plants doesn't make a lot of sense unless you're in the south, southeast, you know, Florida, South Texas, even Louisiana, Alabama through there, because chances are uh, that plants are dormant. But as soon as they rear their heads, when the water temperature is on an upswing headed into the low 60s, get out there and evaluate the vegetation because once it becomes a problem, it becomes expensive to deal with. Now, what, what are the tools you have for aquatic plants? Well, you've got water clarity. So get a Sechi disc. That's a round disc with an X painted in it or a cross painted in it. Opposing corners are black, other opposing corners are white. You drop it in the water and you're measuring the visibility. Based on the visibility depth, you can make decisions on what you should do to change the clarity of your water. Kelly, I'll, I'll answer your question here in a minute. Crop in a four-acre pond, harm it or hurt it? I'll come right back to that. So water, water clarity has a direct influence on what happens with aquatic plants. So what are your tools there? Well, this time of year, if your water is clarity is eight feet, I've got a pond right behind me here. The water clarity is about eight inches, and I got a dadgum cormorant coming in eating my bluegill. So if I don't see him and spook him off, well, then he's going to be there, and, and I started off with several thousand bluegill I put in to grow out so we could use them this year to stock other people's ponds with. But if that water was clear, I know he would have eaten all of them by now. So right now could be a good time to uh, put some pond dye in because by the time the water gets warm enough, the pond dye will have diluted, 
And then, you know, then you can fertilize if you're in an area that needs to be fertilized. Now, I just finished riding the March-April Pond Boss, and if you'll take a look at that March-April, you're going to get some tips on whether you should fertilize or not. So I'm not going to go a whole lot into fertilization since tonight I'm talking about the tools. But the tools you've got to manage aquatic plants is to keep the sunlight off of them. You can do that with a dye this time of year. You can do that by decreasing water clarity with fertility. Now that's a topic for another show. Or you can, um, you can manage aquatic plants with herbicides. That's a tool. Grass carp, that's a tool. So those are tools that you've got in your toolbox. What your job is, is to figure out which is the best tool, when's the best time to use it. And that's part of the ways you look at aquatic plants. Now, I've already talked about aquatic plants in shows before, so I'm not going to get much into that. But you, you, you know that some aquatic plants are good. Native aquatic plants are great. The volume is what makes a difference. If you start getting too many, then they're a nuisance. I'm going to go back to Kelly Chambers. Kelly says, a crappie in a four-acre pond, harm or hurt? I'm going to tell you, here's the thing about crappie, harm or help. Um, crappie, I don't like them in water much smaller than about 20 acres. And the reason I don't is because they're erratic spawners, first of all. And they're predators limited by their mouth size. Bluegill are predators limited by their mouth size, but they have a tiny mouth. You know, largemouth bass are predators. They have a mouth like that. But crappie have a mouth like this. You know, and when you've got a mouth that size and you're a predator, crappie tend to eat lower on the food chain than largemouth bass does. So they're erratic spawners, so you can't predict their spawns. And the second thing is they spawn first of all the warm water fish. So by the time they get through spawning, the other fish are coming on the beds. And guess what? Baby, blue, baby uh, crappie are coming off the nest. So in small waters, typically we've got overcrowded crappie by about the third or fourth year, and we don't like that. There's my niece, Mel Rothermel. Hi, Mel. Good to see you, dear. So I'm going to tell you, don't stock crappie in water less than 20 acres. Now, I'm doing some little... Uh, there, about 10 years ago, there was a fish hatchery in Arkansas that was crossing crappie to create a hybrid with the goal of minimal reproduction. Well, for several years, they weren't able to crack that nut. They were able to get the fish to reproduce, but the offspring were spawning. Maybe not as much as either parent, but still they were spawning. Well, I'm going to see that guy here in a couple of weeks at a conference, and he and I are going to sit down and talk about it, and I'm going to see where, you know, where he's gone now and how that's going. But crappie, as a general rule, don't do it. All right, we've got some more questions coming up here. looks like... Uh, Sydney Goodwin checking in. One of Debbie's friends from Arkansas, Daniel Joseph Thompson. Hey, Bob, four-acre pond built in the 60s. Steep banks, amazingly clear water by Oklahoma standards, pH of 8.32. Bass growth is decent after three years of adding copper dose bluegill and harvesting slot bass. One feeder in use. My question, I have convinced myself to fertilize because I want to experiment and see if I can get more growth. I keep reading that once you start fertilizing, you must do so every year. Why is that? And should I just add another feeder rather than trying to fertilize? Thanks. Okay, great questions. <clears throat> there, it's a wives' tale that once you start, you have to keep going. So basically, when you're fertilizing, and let me here's the first thing I'm going to say to you, Daniel. If you haven't had your water chemistry checked, check it because clear water in Oklahoma <clears throat> often has a lot of gypsum in it, which is calcium sulfate. If you've got that, when you do fertilize, odds are high that that fertilizer, the phosphorus in the fertilizer. Uh, is going to bind with some of the copper, I mean the uh, um, calcium sulfate, and flocculate. In other words, when you put the fertilizer out, the water is going to get cloudy and sink, which means you got to use more fertilizer. So if you needed more fertilizer, it's not because you haven't added enough, it's because it gets bound in something other than plants. So unless you've got a lot of flushing going on, it's, there's not a big commitment to have to fertilize every year. You just fertilize as needed, and you do that by measuring the, your um, visibility depth. All right, now, should you add another feeder? You know what? I'm going to tell you, years ago, I would have answered that. No, you really you got enough feeders, and you need to fertilize. But what I'm going to tell you now is the feeds now have been so well refined. Take Purina, for example. Purina has really zeroed in on fish nutrition, especially for bluegill and other carnivorous fish. Bluegill, uh, largemouth bass that are feed trained. 
Um, even the red ear sunfish that are feed trained. You know, Bruce Candelo spends a lot of time feed training red ear sunfish. You know, and so fish that are feed trained, there are some exquisite feeds out there now that pretty much complete the nutrition as best as it's ever been done. You know, so yes, you can add another feeder and minimize the need for fertility. Now, here's where a fertile pond is real, real important. When a baby fish is first hatched, it's not very big. As a matter of fact, most species, there's 12,000 fish per pound when they first hatch. They have no body fat. Where would it come from? They, they don't have it. So when those little bitty fish absorb what used to be the yolk of their egg and then become swim-up fry, they have to eat. And with little bitty tiny mouths like that, they can only eat microscopic plants and animals. So they got to either graze it off of rocks or plants or something or glean it from the water column. So fertility, fertile water, increases survival rates of newly hatched fish. Now, it takes probably three weeks or four weeks for a, a little bitty baby fish to become large enough to eat the smallest pellets, even if you're feeding a fry food. You know, now if you want to enhance fry survival, get online now and order some fry food, which is the consistency of cornmeal. Now, if you want to do that and you know where your baby fish are spawning and you want to bypass fertilizer, you can use fish food. But your question was, can you add another feeder and make up some slack? Yes, you can. You sure can. That's a good question. Yeah, okay, you said oops. I'm not talking about, Yeah, we're talking about fertilization. We just did it. Danny Mack says, I need some merged plants for my line pond, which I'll plant in containers, about 300 square feet. Hard to find plant suppliers. You know, look at, um, just a minute. Um, over in Brookshire, Texas, is a water garden supplier that grows a bunch of plants. Now, what you'd be looking for is eelgrass. Now you can find, you, in your neighborhood, you can find American pondweed. You can plant that in containers if you want. So yeah, you can do things like that. Craig Govan says, I have three feet of water in our new pond. Should I wait for the water to warm before I put in the minerals? Yes, you want it to be a little deeper than what a heron can wade in and eat your fish. Yeah, you, I tell you my general rule to stock a new pond, I like there to be at least eight feet of water and half the surface acre covered going into a rainy season. Because that way your risk of loss is mitigated because you have enough storage depth that you're not likely for that pond to go dry going into a, a rainy season. All right, let's see here. Dan Durala, where do you get a water chemistry tested? 0.2 acre murky farm pond in Illinois. You know, I tell you, Dan, uh, I'm going to tell you what I know. I, I know that there's a um, land grant university. I think Southern Illinois could check it for you. You can do it through your county extension agent. Or if you want to go online to the Texas A&M University Soil Sciences Lab, look for the standard water well test. If you'll find that and ship it to them and give them your email address and copy me on it, bobblusk at outlook.com or info at pondboss.com, uh, I'll look at those water test results with you and help you figure out what it is. But I like to use Texas A&M's uh, Soil Sciences Lab and do a standard water well test. Now they're gonna ask you, you'll have to print out the form, get a copy of the water, it's 25 bucks, well worth it. And I, that's how I do it. Clayton Bounds, Happy New Year, Happy New Year to you, buddy. And so uh, that's, the, that's the way I would look at that. Now, what are some of the other tools we've got? Um, you know, <clears throat> you guys that have been watching this, hey, John Krause, my friend from Illinois, good to see you. Kelly Duffy must be out of all those meetings he was in today. Good to see you, Kelly. The, uh, um, you know, the four key points of pond management, habitat, of course, the first thing is water. We got to have healthy water, happy water, but habitat, food chain, Genetics, I, listen, I can hear some of you guys repeating this back with me as I'm talking about it. Genetics, harvest. Habitat, food chain, genetics, harvest. All right, in order to make sure those all are prime, you got to evaluate them from time to time. So how do you evaluate habitat? Well, one of the things we do is we use lake mapping for that. Uh, Jason Nepstad's on here watching this. 
he and uh, Justin that works for me, they're working together to create a, a map. And uh, I'm going to answer your questions, Justin. When, I mean, uh, um, Jason, when I get a few minutes. Uh, but if you have a bottom map of your pond, and you can do it from a John boat with a string with a weight on it, if you're plotting depths, and draw out some contours on a piece of paper, or you can map it with a depth finder. That's what Jason's doing, is he's collecting data points that with his side scan sonar, I think if I remember right, he's got a, uh, either a hummingbird or a Lawrence, I can't remember Jason, but with his side scan sonar, he can set it to where he can collect depths and GPS points like every one second or two a second or whatever two seconds to go collect data points and he can plot that back with some software onto a Google Earth map and look at the depths. And that right there is going to tell you something. You, the side scan sonar shows whether you have, have habitat or not, but that topo map can show you, yeah, hummingbird, okay, you know, it shows you areas where you can enhance habitat. You know, so if you want to enhance habitat, man, start with the map. I think maps are huge. They're, they're, they're great help to do that with. You know, now, good gosh, it's already 7-Eleven. Um, one more commercial, Pond Balls Magazine, $35 a year. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. I noticed a number of guys did. If you will do hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comments section, click like and share this to your timeline right now. You're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug. Oh, you know what? We had a drawing winner. Holy cow, Jeremy Duckworth from Princeville, Illinois won the hat and the uh, mug for this go-round. So congratulations, Jeremy. That will be going out to you in the next few days. Okay, so now, going back to our living example of the guy that wants that has bought the 120 acres over near Bonham, Texas, near along the Red River, he's saying, he's asking me, okay, I'm, I want to look at building a new pond. Well, you got some tools there, too. So the... Uh, uh, the way to look at that, if you want to build a pond, the first thing I always do is I go to Google Earth, and there's some there's if you've got if you've got the right program, if you've got Google Earth Pro, you can you can put in you can look at topo maps, and there's some other mapping programs out there as well. But the first thing you want to do is you want to look at the way the Earth falls. So topo maps are a great place to start, and on each one of these online maps, you can draw on it so you can figure out surface area you can figure out how big uh, the watershed is for example for that there's patrick stratman good to see you man how's the feed business barry mounts mark dyer good to see you guys frank i'll circle back to you here in a minute on this so um uh building the new pond the first thing we want to do is look at potential sites now, on a topo map, you're looking at where the, the earth falls, and oftentimes, sometimes not, but oftentimes the steeper the better, and you're looking where there's a confluence maybe of a couple of creeks. So I didn't, I didn't get a chance to really drill down into the uh, uh, topo maps for him. He's not, this guy's not really ready to do that, but I'm going to tell you the tools. So the first thing you want to do is you want to look at some maps and see where the potential sites are to build a dam, and then figure out how big the watershed is and the watershed's pretty much going to dictate how big the pond should be. Let me say that again. The watershed size is going to pretty well dictate how big the pond should be. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, over here in north central Texas, southern Oklahoma, east Texas, it takes about 8 to 10 acres of watershed to support one acre of pond. So if you've got a 100-acre watershed, That'll support an 8 to 10 acre pond or a 10 to 12 acre pond. But if you only want to build a 3 acre pond, then the watershed's too big for that. That's going to help you decide where to place your dam. If you only want a 3 acre pond, then you need to move up in that watershed so that you don't collect that much water. Conversely, you can't put a 30 acre lake on a 10 acre watershed and expect, I mean, a 100 acre watershed and expect that watershed to keep that lake full. It might take it three years to fill up and then you go into a drought may take it three more years to fill back up, you know? So the watershed size is huge. Now you do that with elevations. So you're looking at the different elevations and you're judging the water side, watershed. Watershed is the area that when it rains, the water falls downhill, collects where that site is where you're thinking about building a dam. 
So that's, that's one of the first tools, a map so you can calculate watershed size. The second tool you want is you want, I mean, you got to dig some test holes. So you bring in a track hoe or a backhoe out there to dig some holes and see what kind of dirt you got. And you need somebody that knows dirt. Most of us can't look at dirt and say, yeah, that's good dirt. It's red, but that don't mean that it'll hold water. You know, it's, it's blue. That doesn't mean it's clay. You know, it could be sandy, sandy loam. So you got to figure out what kind of soils you got. So another tool you've got when you're getting ready to build a pond is a transit, a laser level. You know, where you can come in with a laser level, set it up, and you can begin to set flags at your proposed water line. Then you can really get out there on the ground and begin to figure out what the shape of your pond could be. You know, and we do that with just surveyor's flags. We'll go to the lumber yard and get a bundle of surveyor's flags and set them about every 50 feet if we can, and then look and see what the perimeter of the lake's going to look like or the pond. And if you like it, one of the things we see all the time is, oh my gosh, we got a story coming up in the March-April issue you need to read where uh, our good buddy Michael Gray over there in, in uh, Tennessee just bought some property. It's got a little pond on it that leaks. He wants to make that pond bigger, but his limiting factor is a giant oak tree that he doesn't want to kill. So he can't raise the water level up so high that he's going to flood that tree. So he's he's kind of in a little bit, little bit of a dilemma. So quite a bit of his depth is going to have to come from digging down deep so he doesn't kill the tree. You know, so when you're setting flags to find out the elevation and look at what the, the shoreline of your pond or your lake is going to look like, that's going to help you make decisions. So that's one of the tools you've got. So let's see, Frank here says, uh, I need more habitat where my copper nose bluegill, young of the year, can survive. I put Christmas trees and brush on the edge on a spawning bed. That's brilliant. I mean, that's that's good Habitat management, because when those baby fish hatch, they're going to need a place of dense area to, of cover to hide in and escape long enough to not get eaten prematurely. So you said, the question is, does it make sense to cover a significant part of the bed with this type of cover, or would I lose more than I gain? Don't cover the bed with it. Put it around the perimeter. And as much of, that, as much of the Christmas trees as you can stand up, stand them up. I know your bed's going to be sitting in water maybe 18 inches to two feet deep. If you can take some of those Christmas trees, cut some limbs off the bottom, put them in five-gallon buckets, two-thirds full of concrete, and then stand them up out in water maybe seven or eight feet tall, those little bit just right off of the edge of your bluegill beds, those bluegill babies are going to flock to those Christmas trees. Now, that's the upside. The downside is the majority of those needles on that Christmas tree will be gone by summer. And you'll have small limbs left, which the most of those will be gone within another year. And after about three years, uh, that tree is going to be pretty deteriorated and you're going to re want to replace it. So I do Christmas trees every year if you can. Matt Singley. And so the bottom line is don't put the trees on the bed because if you put them on the beds, then the males won't come in and reproduce because they, they, they want to be able to see in a 360 degree circle so they can see what's coming at them. You know, if there's Christmas trees laying in the spawning beds, snakes are going to live in it. They're going to come and eat those fish as fast as they can eat them. So it's, it's move them away from the spawning beds, put them on the perimeter out a few feet. You know, a few feet, what that means to me is eight feet, 10 feet, you know, 15 feet off the spawning beds. Because when those baby fish, when those fry are hatched, they're going to linger close to the nest. Then they're going to rise in a wad in a school. Then they're going to migrate away and they're going to head for cover. So if it's within 15 feet, 20 feet of the spawning bed, they're going to find it. Now, another thing you can do is let some aquatic plants grow around the, the edges of the lake, not too far away from your spawning beds. That's even better habitat because it's going to be there when they need it. <clears throat> Matt Singley says, I'm building a two-acre catfish pond in South Mississippi. How many catfish fingerlings should I stock? It's three to ten feet deep. <clears throat> okay. Matt, stock as many as you can eat. <laughs> now, here's the way Here's the way I'm going to tell you about that. This will be kind of funny. Listen up. Uh, if you're going to put them in and eat quite a few, you can stock up to a thousand per acre. You can put two thousand in there, but and you need to feed them heavily, be able to replace some water. And if you're in the Mississippi Delta, you should be able to replace water either with a lot of rain or with a well. Which I don't know your circumstances, but 
uh, if you put two, don't put more than two thousand. And once they hit, once the biggest and the best ones hit a pound and a half, start eating them. Now that's if you eat a lot of fish and you don't give away some fish and you're going to feed the neighbors. You can stock up to a thousand. I don't have many people do that. I've got a three quarter acre catfish pond and I've got five hundred in it, and we eat them as quick as we can and we let kids catch them and we enjoy the heck out of them. Now, if if uh, if you're not going to eat a lot, you know, cut that number back. You can go down as low. Like I've got people saying, "Well, I don't want that many," so we'll I'll tell them to put fifty per acre, especially if they're going to name them. Well, there's Jimmy, there's Tommy, and there's little Scarface swimming up eating the fish food. You know, so stock the number based on what you expect your harvest to be. Now, if you think you're going to eat, you know, uh, if you think you're going to eat. In a 365-day year, you're going to eat, you know, 25 pounds a week. You know, do the math on that. That's 100 pounds a month. That's 1,200 pounds. You can stock 500 or 600 fish, and as they start getting to be two, two and a half, three pounds, start culling them, and then replace them every other year. That's another way to do it. So don't count on them reproducing, and channel catch what you want to use. So, uh, uh, that's the way to pick pick the number based on what you're going to harvest. If your harvest is going to be low, pick a low number. If you think your harvest is going to be high, pick a higher number. But the more that you stock, the more you're going to have to harvest, the more you're going to feed them, the more they're going to grow, and you're going to need to be culling, culling, culling all the time. So stock lower numbers. Ian Reynolds, Paul Picard, checking in from Mississippi. Let's see here. Um... Joshua McCurry, late but checking in. Well, good deal. You have to rewind and watch from the top. This has been a pretty good show, if I say so myself. Todd Corey, what type of aquatic plants do you suggest for a new third acre pond? Nine hours, let's see, 9H. I don't know what that means. Nine hours north Michigan in the spring when the ice melts for fish stocking. Depth up to 15 feet. Todd, I tell you what I'm going to recommend for you. If you can find some American pond weed that you can plant around the perimeter. I don't know how well eelgrass does in the north. Um, there's a there's Liz Adams checking in, one of Debbie's friends. Hey, Liz, good to see you, dear. I'm glad you're checking in with us. But, Todd, if you can um, check some of the surrounding ponds. Now, you want to avoid... Let me tell you what to avoid. Avoid Eurasian watermill foil. Uh, I, you know... I, there's mixed thoughts about curly leaf pond weed. I kind of like it because it grows really fast, it peaks, and then it drops off in northern waters. So I kind of like curly leaf pond weed. So I would be looking at that. I'd look at eelgrass. I'd look at American pond weed. I tell you what, look at the pond weeds. There's Illinois pond weed. There's a small leaf pond. There's a bunch of different pond weeds. I think that might be one of your best choices. So if anybody's got any more questions, throw them at me real quick. Jason Nepstad, will eelgrass grow, grow in muck? Yes, it will. If not, what, what should we plant in the mucky areas? Now, I want to have a conversation with you because I understand you're going to draw the lake down. But eelgrass will grow in muck. It sure will. And it'll grow. Now, one thing, now here's the deal about Jason's Lake. Jason's Lake's got a lot of carp, common carp, um, Israeli carp, mirror carp, Japanese koi. So the problem there is they're always rooting things up. So if you're going to plant eelgrass in a lake that's got issues like that, then put a cage around it. You can use chicken wire. That's easy to do. You know, four T-posts, chicken wire to where the carp can't get to it. Give it a chance to get established and then build another one, build another one. Then once it establishes, and maybe if you guys work hard and get your carp numbers down, then you can establish eelgrass. But eelgrass would definitely grow in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Okay, so uh, Jason Davis checking in. Todd Corey, cattails. You know, I think I'd avoid cattails because they tend to be invasive. Now, Todd, if you want to choose cattails, buy some and look for dwarf cattails. Look for that. See if you can do that. If you can find dwarf cattails, that's going to work much, much, much better. Um, Jason Nepstad, draining the lake to remove all the carp. Man, that sounds easy. I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk about it you know, as, as you get ready to do this. So you and I need to have a conversation and we need to do it soon, like within the next couple of days. Uh, Barry Mounts, my pond is finally ready to stock. One and a half acres that I plan to stock with bluegill, shellcrackers, and largemouth bass. How soon can I do so in South LA? 
South Louisiana. I tell you what, Barry, um, uh, your water's probably warm enough that you can do that now. If you need some help with it, Pond Boss has got several vendors that can help service you. If you'll let me know, send me an email. Just send it to info at pondboss.com. But here's the question I've got for you. Uh, if you look around you and if you see very many cormorants, water turkeys, pelicans, things like that, which South Louisiana is notorious for those creatures, if you see very many predatory birds like that, I think I'd resist stocking and put those in, you know, maybe in March or April. Your water's warm enough now that you can do it and they'd probably start growing, but you don't gain a lot if you've got predators that can come and eat those fish. So why don't you email me and let's have a longer discussion. Email me your phone number and I'll call you and we can talk about it. All right, so uh, Mark Dyer Pond is three acre deep. I mean, three acres, six feet deep in Nebraska. Will American Pondweed take over the whole pond at that depth? No, it won't. Now, it, the, I'm going to retract that just a touch. If you've got crystal clear water six feet deep, then that increases the odds that they could take it over. Now, six feet deep, you know, I don't know what your slopes are like. If you've got three to one slopes, then you're probably going to have pond weed growing in water as deep as three feet deep, you know, which that could be half the pond. So uh, it might be in your best interest to not have any plants and maybe use some, you know, some moss back fish attractors, something like that. <clears throat> okay, uh, holy cow, we got some things coming in. Corey Schroepfer checked in. Let's see, Chad Bowman, weird question. I have a lot of prickly pear cactus right next to my three acre tank. Would it hurt to throw them in the tank or do I just need to poke them, poke them up and poison and very carefully? You just hate using poison next to the new tank. If you use, if you use the approved herbicides in the concentrations that's called for, it's fine. Now, here's the problem with throwing cactus into a pond. It floats. <laughs> Guess how I know that. <laughs> and when you put it in there and it floats, and if it doesn't float, the pulp inside the leaves of the cactus will begin to ferment and mold and do some things like that. So, don't put any cactus in the water itself because it really doesn't help. Mark Dyer, water lilies. Yeah, that's a good idea. Water lilies are a great idea. You bet. Let me kind of clean things up here. Let me see if I've got anything else that I've missed. I think, oh my, I'm looking at my notes. Yeah, I pretty well covered everything I wanted to cover tonight. So, you know, uh, one more time, hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. You'll get a chance at a hat, mug, if you do that and click like and share this to your timeline so people can see it because we want to spread the word. We're, you know, one of our goals at Pond Boss Magazine and one of my personal goals to be, to be somebody that's helping do something significant is to teach as many people as we can how to be better stewards of their land and water. You know, here's one of the things that I see. There's somewhere, just in Texas, there's 1.2 million private ponds and lakes and the NRCS estimates across the nation somewhere between four and a half and six million private ponds and lakes. And if we could just teach 10%, no wait, 1% of those people how to be better stewards of their land and water, that's 60,000 people. You know, and I just really want to spread the word and help them. Bruce Candelo, the mug is excellent, holy coffee, not, not leak. <laughs> that's the comment of the day, dude. All right, Dan Drollop, any suggestion to deter blue herons from visiting that actually works? You know what? <clears throat> um, no, not really. The thing is, is they won't, they don't like to walk in deep water. You know, so there's nothing that I know of that actually works to deter them except loud noises. And I have heard there's a product called Away With Geese that has a laser that goes round and around. If you can set it at eye level, with the herons, that seems to disrupt their, uh, that just seems to disrupt the way that they behave. Well, all right, you know what? Looks like we've had another good show. The hour's gone, and uh, I haven't thought of a topic yet. If you guys have topic ideas that you want to hear more about with your pond management, fish management, plants, aquatic, anything with water, with ponds, recreational ponds, uh, send me a note. Put a comment on the Facebook page. Email me at info at pondmoss.com. Please subscribe to the magazine, 35 bucks a year. So, until next Wednesday, I'm going to be checking out. Oh, next Wednesday, actually, 
No, no, no. The Wednesday following, I will be at a conference in Memphis, Tennessee with a bunch of pond management people. So I bet we'll have a few guests. So I'm going to wrap it up. We will see you next Wednesday. Thanks for joining us. Good luck to you. Happy New Year. Adios.